Good morning. This is the Tuesday, May 18th meeting of the Assembly Judiciary Committee. I'm Mike Fuhr. I'm the chair of the committee. We are joined by uh, not only committee members, but also our colleague, the Majority Floor Leader, Mr. Calderon, which is great. Nice to see you here this morning. Um, and we are joined also by a very esteemed group of judges and scholars who are here today to help us explore a really vexing emerging issue. And that is how to assure we retain judicial independence in an era uh, where campaign contributions are increasingly unregulated pursuant to rulings of the Supreme Court. What do we do? How do we assure that the, there is both the reality and the widely shared perception that judges are acting on the merits rather than on any other basis? And so what I'd like to do at the inception of our hearing is proceed in a little bit of an unorthodox way and show a very short compilation of television commercials from around the country that have emerged recently in, uh, as we've seen this, as I said, increasingly unregulated world where campaign contributions are beginning to creep into campaigns and the commercials that are funded by that campaign money is, I think, a threat to the independence of the judiciary. Please. If Justice Alexander hadn't voted for this decision, this wouldn't have happened. Judge Alexander is in touch with this issue. I'm here supporting John Groen because John Groen has four victims and their families. Justice for sale? John Groen and far-right extremists are trying to buy our Supreme Court. So extreme, they want to gut protections for our clean air and water. They oppose stem cell research and a woman's right to choose. Special interests, skirting campaign finance laws, bankrolling John Groen. Keep our courts fair and impartial. Vote for Gary Alexander. Join law enforcement, prosecutors, and all major newspapers. Vote for Gary Alexander. Protect our constitutional rights. Alabama's greedy trial lawyers spend big bucks opposing our conservative values. Take the case of Judge Tom Parker. Parker accepted more than one quarter of a million dollars from liberal trial lawyers. Then he tried to conceal it. The trial lawyer's liberal agenda helps to drive up the costs of goods and services and erodes our family values. Learn more about Tom Parker and his ties to liberal trial lawyers. 
Nine years ago, a vicious thug raped and repeatedly stabbed a pregnant woman, leaving her and her unborn child to die. Convicted of rape and murder, Ronaldo Adams was sentenced to death. But now, Adams is off death row, thanks to Chief Justice Drayton Neighbors and the Alabama Supreme Court using a 5-4 to four decision based on foreign law and unratified U.N. treaties. Alabama's courts need to stand up for American law, not foreign law. Some things are worth fighting for. Tom Parker for Chief Justice. Fair, balanced, unafraid. Ralph Armstrong was a convicted rapist out on parole when he raped, beat, and strangled a 19-year-old co-ed to death. There was eyewitness testimony, fingerprints at the crime scene, and blood under Armstrong's fingernails. But Lewis Butler wrote the decision to overturn this rapist's conviction. On cases taken up by the Supreme Court, Butler sides with criminals nearly 60% of the time. Tell Lewis Butler, victims, not criminals, deserve justice. Remember Mike Gableman, the big political contributor who became a judge? How's he doing? Gableman's court ranks near the bottom because it takes so long to try felons. His backlog means criminals often spend too much time on the streets before going to prison. And Gableman's decisions are ruled incorrect and overturned by higher courts about a third of the time. He ranks in the bottom quarter of all Wisconsin judges. Tell Mike Gableman we need higher standards for... Imagine a sexual predator attacks a young girl, then forces her to watch the attack on video. Judge Michael Gableman said this criminal only had to spend one year in jail. Another child sexual predator gets convicted. Even his own family feared he was a threat to other children. But Michael Gableman lets him off easy, sentencing him to a fraction of the jail time he could have gotten. Judge Michael Gableman, protecting criminals, not Wisconsin families. We've heard it before. Judge Sides Loophole sides with criminal that threatens our safety. Take Justice Lewis Butler. His colleagues called him Loophole Louie, a woman beaten to death with a bat. Butler uses a loophole suppressing critical evidence. A husband poisoned his wife. Butler cites a loophole, almost jeopardizing the prosecution. But almost done, but I think you get the idea. The, those of us who are elected officials in this room find these commercials, I think, uncomfortably close to what we deal with. Uh, the judges who are sitting in this room are probably wincing as they watch these co commercials because, you know, they attack liberals, they attack conservatives, but they have one thing in common, and that is that each one of these commercials erodes the perception that justice is anything other than a political game. Uh, with that in mind, why don't we introduce our first panelist, uh, a very distinguished professor, Erwin Chemerinsky, the dean of the law school at UC Irvine, an old friend of mine who has a tremendously esteemed background as a scholar, as an advocate, as an attorney, as uh, so many things in public service. And uh, Dean Chemerinsky is here to begin our conversation uh, discussing the implications of the Supreme Court's most recent ruling in the Citizens United case regarding the regulation of campaign contributions. Dean Chemerinsky, Thank as always, so it's much. a real pleasure to see you. Oh, it's truly my pleasure. Thank you, Selwyn, for, for the very kind introduction. Um, I did prepare a short statement. I wasn't sure how many copies, so I've got 10 copies of it here, if that would be useful to you. Um, Unfortunately, I think the reality of Citizens United is that the commercials that you just saw are going to become much more the norm in any state that has judicial elections because the reality now is that corporations and unions can spend as much as they choose to get the candidates they want elected, the candidates they oppose defeated. Everyone here is already familiar with the Supreme Court's decision from January in Citizens United. There the Supreme Court held that corporations have the same first right as individuals to spend as much money as they want in election campaigns. What this means is that corporations and unions will no longer need to create a political action committee in order to be able to spend money. Money can come directly from the coffers of corporations and unions. Now I want to be clear that Citizens United dealt only with the issue of independent expenditures by corporations and implicitly by unions. It didn't deal with laws that restrict contributions by corporations and unions. So it remains constitutional right now for both Congress at the federal level and state legislatures at the state level to limit contributions made directly to candidates for office 
including contributions to judges. However, in the past, Justices Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas have taken the position that such restrictions on corporate contributions to candidates violate the First Amendment. Once the Supreme Court says in Citizens United that corporations have the same free speech rights as individuals, it's hard to see how in the future the court would allow such contribution limits to stand. In fact, in the past, Justices Scalia, Kennedy, and Thomas have taken the position that any limit on contributions other than disclosure requirements violate the First Amendment, and it seems there's now five votes for that position as well, though that, of course, would require a decision in the future. So Citizens United is very significant in itself with regard to all elections, but it may even be more important in the future in terms of where the court goes as contribution limits are likely to follow expenditure limits and being struck down. I believe one of the most pernicious aspects of Citizens United will be its implications with regard to judicial elections. The materials before your committee document that the costs of judicial elections are increasing across the country, and the money that comes to elect or defeat judges comes from the lawyers and the parties that have cases before them. Not long ago, I was speaking to a judge, a very esteemed judge in Los Angeles County, and she said to me that regularly in the judge's lunchroom there's discussion over which law firms contribute the most money to judicial campaigns. And she said it's inherently uncomfortable to then go before, out onto the bench and have those very same law firms and lawyers appear before her. In Caperton versus Massey Cole, which Professor Carlin's been discussing later this morning, the Supreme Court held that if corporate officials contribute a significant amount of money to get a judge elected or defeated, then that would require that the judge recuse from the bench, that due process is violated if corporate officials have given too much to get that candidate elected. Well, the intersection between Citizens United and Caperton versus Massey Gold creates a perverse guessing game for corporate officials and for that matter the lawyers. Corporations will now want to give enough money to get the candidates they choose elected, but not so much to require that those candidates be recused once elected to the bench, because the Supreme Court in Caperton didn't define where that line is. Inevitably, it's a guessing game as to how to give just enough to get your candidate elected, but not too much that when your case is before the judge, the judge will have to be recused. There's many things that the Assembly and the Legislature might consider doing in light of Citizens United. First, in theory it's possible to argue that judicial elections are different from other elections, that therefore expenditure limits are going to be permissible with regard to judicial elections when they wouldn't be permissible with regard to other elections. Maybe 20 years ago, I wrote a law review article that argued exactly that, that said that the distinction that Buckley versus Vallejo drew in 1976, that contribution limits were permissible, but expenditure limits were impermissible, might be rethought with regard to judicial elections for all of the obvious reasons, all of the reasons why it's so essential that we have judges where there's not the appearance of impropriety. I think there's an argument that judicial elections simply are different. I think while this is a plausible argument, it will be a difficult one after the Supreme Court's decision in Republican Party in Minnesota versus White in 2002. There, in an opinion by Justice Scalia, the Supreme Court rejected a distinction between judicial elections and other elections. There, to be specific, the Supreme Court struck down a state law that said that candidates for judicial office could not make statements about disputed legal or political issues. Now, perhaps you can argue that White was limited to that context my guess is that in light of Citizens United, a limit on corporate expenditures with regard to judicial elections would be unlikely to be upheld. Second, after Caperton and after Citizens United, a state may set a spending cap beyond which disqualification is warranted. I know this is what AB 2487 has done in saying that if a judge must recuse himself if the judge has received campaign contributions of more than $1,500. As I understand it, this has passed the Assembly and is now pending in the Senate, and I think this is an extremely important bill. But my understanding is that it relates to contributions, not to independent expenditures, and I would hope that in light of Citizens United, the legislature would consider expanding this to include independent expenditures as well as contributions. As Professor Carlin will talk about, 
the Caperton versus Massey Cole was independent expenditures by corporate officials, and that's what required the recusal. And I would think that the same need for independent expenditures to trigger recusal as there is with regard to contributions. Third, there's a whole host of proposals that are being tried in other states that might be considered in California. Some are more specific to judicial elections. Some are more general but could be applied to judicial elections. North Carolina, for example, has adopted public financing of judicial elections. I realize this is not the time in California for any bill that's likely to require substantial additional expenditures, but public funding of elections is one response to Citizens United, and it may be particularly important with regard to judicial elections. The state of Iowa has recently adopted a law in light of Citizens United that requires that a corporation's board of directors approve political expenditures before a corporation makes them. This, I think, would limit corporate expenditures. It would also protect corporate shareholders. This could be adopted by California across the board. It also, of course, could be adopted just with regard to judicial elections. The proposal has been introduced into Congress, and similar proposals have been introduced in many state legislatures that would say that corporations that enter into contracts with the government can't then spend money in election campaigns. An analogy would be drawn to civil service type restrictions that limit the ability of government employees to engage in political activities, saying that government contractors are analogous to the employees and the restrictions are permissible. It's unclear whether the courts would uphold this as constitutional. There's certainly an argument that it would be an impermissible unconstitutional condition. On the other hand, there's an argument that this has long been upheld in the context of civil service, so it should be upheld as well. Also, it has to be remembered that in Citizens United, the Supreme Court, by an eight to one margin, upheld the disclosure requirements. So more stringent disclosure requirements are permissible. There is an unusual effect, though, of disclosure requirements in judicial elections. It does mean, then, that the judges know even more who it is that paid the money to get them elected or who paid the money to get them defeated. On the other hand, I think disclosure requirements are such a hallmark of good government, they're desirable. There's obviously no single perfect solution to the problems raised by Citizens United for judicial elections, but I really do believe that Citizens United has the greatest effect to do harm with regard to the judiciary, and so I applaud the Judiciary Committee for looking at it today. I'm glad to answer any questions and also to be of assistance to you in the long term in any way I can. Dean, thank you very much. I have a few questions, but I think my colleagues do too, and I see Mr. Calderon reaching for his microphone. Do you have a question? <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, I'm wondering how um, the, um, the, the, the time in between elections for judges, as opposed to other elected officials, bears on the issue. Uh, every six years, every what, 13, 12 years for appellate and Supreme Court. Uh, does that, um, does that uh, factor into the type of influence that uh, many feel as you've, just, you've ex explained, that many feel might um, um, affect the independence of the judiciary. It means that corporate spending is likely to come in the period just before the election rather than be in the longer term period. Now, Nevada has adopted a law that says that judges cannot create campaign committees until they have a registered opponent. Now, the problem with that is it could put incumbents at a tremendous disadvantage because it would limit the ability of the incumbent to begin doing fundraising until perhaps it's too late to be effective in doing fundraising. I also think, in light of other Supreme Court cases, as well as Citizens United, that that's likely unconstitutional. Once it's said that corporations have the right to spend money, and once there's the right to at least contribute some money, I don't know how a temporal limit can be put on that. So the answer is, I think, that what it does is concentrate the effect into the period before the election, but that's probably the same with regard to United States senators who face six-year elections as compared to, say, members of the United States House of Representatives who face elections every two years. Yeah, well, I, I tend to agree that this is a horrible case because it not only has implication for judiciary, right. it now means that policy is not gonna be made in the legislature, it's gonna be made on the airways, and we saw that during the Obama health um, care debate. So um, I, I think it's, it's an issue 
that I understand a little bit better now than I did uh, when Mr. Fierov took up a bill that says over 1,500, uh, you got to recuse under 1,500 um, judges aren't affected. And so, but now this begins to make a little bit more sense to me. And Mr. Fierov's bill, of course, follows very much from what the ABA has recommended that states do and follows within that. If I could just add one other area that isn't directly with regard to judges, I worry about what Citizens United is going to mean in small cities, small towns, where a corporation can have tremendous influence in spending and there's nobody else there who could possibly match the corporate resources. And I don't think the Supreme Court has thought about that by focusing on just the national elections and McCain-Feingold and the Bipartisan Campaign Finance Reform Act. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Calderon. L let me ask a couple questions while my colleagues also gather some thoughts. Um, let me follow up on something that Mr. Calderon just asked. I have been in discussions where it has been suggested to me that having the recusal restriction pertain to the entirety of a judge's term, six years, has the following negative impact. It conveys to the public by tying it to the term of office that judges are more like politicians than independent jurists, and that by setting a different shorter period, one somehow differentiates judges from elected officials. I currently, in the legislation I've authored, set that period in which recusal or disclosure are required for the entirety of the term. Do you think that there is merit in the critique that I mentioned? And in any event, do you think that limitations, even those in my legislation, send the wrong impression that judges are more like politicians than independent jurists? Once there are judicial elections, judges are politicians. And so when you have contested elections, say, for the Superior Court, no matter how you try to camouflage that, judges are politicians. Now, retention elections make it less so because they're a different form of elections than we're used to. And thankfully in California, relatively rarely is there a campaign against somebody who's facing a retention election. But if there is a campaign against somebody, then the judge is made into a politician. This was Justice O'Connor's point in her concurring opinion in Republican Party Minnesota versus White. Once you have a judicial election, judges are made into politicians. I don't think you change that perception, whether the recusal is for two years, four years, or six years. The judge is still made into a politician. And my belief is if more than $1,500 creates the appearance of impropriety in the first two years, it does so in years three through six as well. Yeah, well that, what you stated happens to mirror my view, but now it has credibility. Which <laughs> um, let me, uh, so thank you for that. Let, let, me, let me refer to retention elections for a moment. The, uh, the legislation that at least I've authored currently pertains exclusively to elections of Superior Court judges. I've been grappling with its application to appellate jurists. It's been said by some that appellate jurists are in a different position for a variety of reasons, not the least of which is because of the way appellate panels are impaneled, a con contributor may not even know in a given case where that contribution may go. Uh, the retention elections also require, if there's a contested election of any kind, major, so major amounts of money, which has implications for the amounts that might be restricted and so on. What do you think about the application of such limitations into appellate jurists or to Supreme Court uh, judges, justices who are seeking retention? Well, as you know, and as Professor Carlin will talk about, the Caperton versus Nancy Cole involved the West Virginia Supreme Court. Nancy Cole spent the $3 million, their officials spent $3 million precisely because they wanted to get Brent and Benjamin elected and get the incumbent defeated. And it's certainly possible in California that there could be an attempt to get uh, incumbent justice defeated. Um, there is a difference between spending money to get somebody elected and spending money to get somebody defeated. But in the end, I think it all comes out to the same place. Um, I think the same thing is true at the appellate level. You're right that you generally can't know who your appellate panel is going to be, but the reason that corporations spend a lot of money, or unions or anybody else, is to get people on the bench who they think will rule in their favor. Perhaps a different dollar amount is appropriate for the appellate level, but in principle I don't see any reason to draw a distinction between the appellate level and the trial level. In fact, at the appellate level the rulings are more visible and have even more effect 
which would then mean there's even greater need for making sure that we have the appearance of impropriety, or avoid yeah. the appearance of impropriety. Well, so, but let's, let, let me ask this one question and then turn to my colleagues. Uh, do you think that retention elections are meaningfully different when it comes to this analysis of the appearance of uh, bias, the appearance of being beholden to a donor, in the sense that, as you point out, a retention election is typically not a contested election in the narrow sense. There's one person on the ballot, not two, so that while one may be giving money to defeat the incumbent jurist, one doesn't know the identity of who will succeed that person. And therefore, one might argue that the rationale for requ requiring recusal, limiting expenditures, and so on, is quite different. What do you think about that? But you're looking at only one half of the coin. The other half of the coin is those who would contribute money to keep that person on the bench. Mm -hmm. So imagine there's a contested retention election, and imagine that there are special interests that are spending a great deal of money to that person defeated. The candidate will then have a committee to try to raise money to keep that person on the bench, and there will be other interests, corporations, unions, that will spend a great deal of money to, on their own to keep that person on the bench. Now imagine that person wins retention. The question is, should those who spent so much money to get the person retained, keep the person on the bench, now be able to have that judge judging their cases? And there's also the, well, if you spent a lot of money to get somebody defeated, how do you feel about that person then being your judge? Yeah, and, and let, me, let me say, I, I agree with that analysis as well. And uh, to share with my colleagues, I clerked on the California Supreme Court for a justice who in an extremely divisive campaign was recalled. Um, uh, Justice Grodin, who was part of a, the, the Supreme Court and, and part of that election in which Rose Byrd and Cruz Reynoso were also uh, removed from office. And I will tell you that for any sitting jurist to uh, have to raise campaign funds from supporters is an especially uncomfortable position to be in. And I think the fact of that dynamic itself requires, I think, us to consider very seriously how we deal with judicial elections. Um, uh, picture who a judge's constituency is likely to be. At the trial court level in particular, it's going to be, as was pointed out earlier, people who practice before that judge. Um, severe problems associated with that, and we have to contend with them in a very serious way. Um, colleagues, any further questions? Uh, Kurt, Mr. Hagman. Hey, and I'm sorry, I'm, I'm probably a far different level on this, this. I mean, I have exposure to courts over the last 20 years, but never on the, the level you guys have. It's definitely not on the campaign level. I do know as a normal citizen, trying to, to pick and choose my judges um, for election has been quite challenging. I mean, even with my exposure to the courts, as far as knowing what the records are or if there is, you know, some judges are very specialized in their field. Some are arraignment court judges in the criminal side or have a certain, you see the same one over and over doing certain kind of motions, those type of things. I can see how this can play positive or negative. I'm, I'm thinking all the different things for IEs. I mean, as far as, one thing I'd like to step back is every time we bring up corporate spending, um, for, for at least my point of view, is equal with other special interest groups of money, when that's individuals, unions, or different associations. So when we look at limits, I don't want to pick and choose winners. I want to do something that's broad-based across the board from, from, my, from my standpoint. But even if, you're, if you have a particular jurist that you go in front of on an occasion basis or industry does, and you sit there and contribute to the campaign either for or against, and you eliminate that person, even though he's a specialized judge in your field, how does that work then? I mean, is there anybody else who can take over in that courthouse or that county um, because there is one a person that handles all these particular type of business in there? So those are the practical side. I'm not sure how you you fit with the bill that we passed out of judiciary and, and on the, from the floor. How is that practice applied to those who are very specialized in their field? And um, I'm thinking motions on certain aspects and things. Just in my little world that we see the same jurists all the time in a particular county. So that's the part I don't understand. How do you apply that? And I do understand the politics behind it. But again, when you went from a district where judges represent a certain area of in your city or a certain court, and those people around there started voting on those judges to a whole countywide, especially dealing with counties like LA County with this hundreds of them, or you know, larger areas, it makes it very difficult even to know who you're voting for. So without getting some kind of information or some kind of independent body to say, this one hasn't been overturned as much as this one, or you know, apply the law. I don't know how you make decisions on the voting for citizens either. Well, let me just make two quick points in response. First, the problem of not knowing who the judges are who are running for election 
is inherent to having judicial elections. Um, and the choice to have judicial elections, to have accountability, has many benefits. But a cost of it is the usual assumption of the political process of a knowing electorate making choices just doesn't apply in this context. Now, I'm skeptical that having a lot more money spent with regard to judicial elections is going to translate into better informed voters. You only need to look at the commercials that began the hearing to say, I doubt that anybody got accurate information from those about who the judges were or the context of their rulings. Second is to your specific question, there's always going to be instances in which any judge will be disqualified. Even if the, the, the bill now before the Senate doesn't get passed, there's that. And so in areas where you have only one judge, already there will be situations where that judge is going to be recused and you have to bring in a judge from a neighboring county. This may somewhat expand that number of instances, but it doesn't create a new problem because any judge is going to have some conflict of interest where recusal is required. Thank you, Mr. Hagman. Now, Mr. Calderon. I, uh, you know, if you could talk a little bit more about what I thought um, you suggested might be a way um, the legislature might want to go in terms of limiting um, expenditures by independent expenditure committees. Um, and then, I guess since I'll, I don't want to take, t and then um, with the California initiative process, judges are no longer in that context uh, resolving disputes between two neighbors and a, and a tree branch, overhanging tree branch. They're making law when they make when they decide on the constitutionality of these decisions, which have policy implications. Um, and so how does that play into um, anything we might do to try and preserve the independence of the judiciary? As to your first question, I've long believed that because judicial elections are different from other elections, campaign finance rules that might not be permissible in other contexts might be with regard to judicial elections. So as I mentioned a long time ago, I wrote an article that said, well, Buckley versus Vallejo says that generally expenditure limits are unconstitutional. We should say in judicial elections, they could be permissible because of all the reasons we want judges to avoid even the appearance of impropriety. Now, I think Republican Party of Minnesota versus White makes it difficult to make that argument. It doesn't make it impossible. And it's certainly conceivable that some legislature may say that they're going to try, even after Citizens United, to restrict independent expenditures with regard to judicial elections and try to argue to the court that judicial elections are different. Um, I'm skeptical that it would succeed. I think it's at least theoretically possible. Um, as to the latter question, um, I'm not sure it would be the answer. I mean, I, I think that there's many things that the legislature might do in order to try to restrict the influence of special interests with regard to judicial elections. It all starts from the premise that judges are different from other office holders. Now, you say now courts are making law. That's not something that's new. Courts have always made law. All of the tort law of California is judge-made law, and it's always been. Almost all the contract law is judge-made law, and it's always been that way. What the California Supreme Court says one way or another in interpreting the state constitution is making the law of California. Now, in light of that, the question is, what does that tell us as to how we want to choose our judges? And then once we made that choice, what does that tell us about how we want to fund those campaigns? Again, I start from the premise that judges are different from other office holders, so we should think about a different set of arrangements for judicial elections. I I do think it's a little, it seems different um, because when you, when you interpret the law in the context of a dispute, you have a factual background um, which serves as the basis for the analysis. And when you're interpreting or when a judge interprets a, a statute, a constitutional initiative, a statute initiative, um, there aren't, there isn't a dispute that, that kind of, um, um, you know, guides the, the discussion and the analysis. But, I mean, maybe, maybe uh, you know, I'm missing something, but it seems that there's something different. But every case has a dispute. 
Now, in the context of a challenge to an initiative, it may be a facial challenge before you have the concrete set of facts. And in most cases, you do have a concrete set of facts. But in all instances, judges are interpreting the law to the best of their ability. But whatever they decide is making the law for the state of California. Dean, I have one final question for you, and then we'll turn to our next esteemed panelist here. In my prior political life I, on the city council in Los Angeles, I introduced legislation that would have created significant impacts when independent expenditures were applied in certain elections. Uh, a critique was offered of that legislation, and the critique was that when you are evaluating on whose behalf an independent expenditure was made, the analysis is more complex than it is when you're evaluating simply who gave money to an individual uh, directly. And that there was a lot of opportunity for gaming the system if you regulated independent expenditures in an election. You're suggesting that there may be some real value in the wake of Citizens United in having us identify judicial elections as being different from others and as a consequence regulating independent expenditures. What do you think of the critique that IEs are much more difficult to regulate, much more difficult to ascertain on whose behalf they were made, much more potential for gaming the system? I'll go to the commercials that you began the hearing. Is there any doubt with regard to any of those commercials what the goal was of the person who paid for them? Mm -hmm. I would say in each of those instances, and I assume they were paid for by independent expenditures, we knew exactly what those who put out those commercials were trying to accomplish. If nothing else, we can go here, as we do so often in law, to the reasonable person test. Would the reasonable observer perceive this as an independent expenditure to get this person elected to the bench or to have this person defeated from the bench? Mm -hmm. And that was the test that the Supreme Court used before Citizens United in deciding whether or not an issue ad fell within the purview of this provision of McCain-Feingold. Yeah. Would it be perceived as being for or against an identifiable candidate? I think the reasonable person test would be the answer to that. Yeah. And I will say also that I think on the gaming point, which is to say a group could decide to contribute on behalf of a candidate for the purpose of disqualifying that judge later on, that provisions like that which exist in the bill that I've authored, enabling the other party in the litigation to weigh the disqualification requirement should mitigate the negative impact of that gaming effort. And that too is something the ABA has recommended. Yes. Dean, thank you so thank much you for your yourself. testimony and for your response uh, to questions. Thank you really so appreciate much. your thank being you here. And now let me turn to our next very esteemed panelist, Professor Pam Carlin uh, from Stanford University, who is one of the nation's leading experts on politics, voting rights, and such like, um, uh, a very esteemed practitioner and scholar, a former commissioner of the FPPC, and a real expert on judicial elections, who's here today to speak to us regarding the Caperton case. Professor Carlin, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a tremendous honor for me to be here. Um, on the uh, door of my office, I keep a number of cartoons, and uh, one of them is probably well known to you. It's a cartoon from The New Yorker. It's a lawyer sitting behind his desk, and the caption reads, you have a pretty good case, Mr. Pitkin. How much justice can you afford? Um, I thought about that cartoon quite a bit when I was preparing for today's um, testimony. Uh, because the truth is that, uh, on the one hand, even uh, with the courts closed one day a month, Californians actually get more justice than they're paying for. But on the other hand, cases like Caperton suggest that some people are paying some for something that isn't justice uh, at all. Uh, today what I'm going to do is talk a little bit with you about the Caperton against uh, A.T. Massey Cole case and then report on some interesting new data that we developed uh, in a nationwide public survey of both the public and uh, members of the executive, legislative, and judicial branches across the country uh, for an American Bar Association summit uh, held last spring in Charlotte on independent courts. Um, first of all, on Caperton itself, I think that uh, Drew and Tom did a fantastic job of summarizing the case in their background paper for you. So I'll just talk a little bit about some of the implications that I see for California and some of the complications given California's system. Uh, the central point of the Supreme Court's decision in Caperton, which was a very narrow five to four decision, was that the due, due process clause of the federal constitution was violated by the refusal of a justice to recuse himself uh, in the wake of uh, $3 million 
in independent expenditures made by an officer of a corporation that had a case that was working its way up uh, to the State Supreme Court. Uh, but the case leaves open a number of issues, and so let me just start with the opening sentence of the opinion, because I think this will give you a sense of things, which is, in this case, the Supreme Court of, of Appeals of West Virginia reversed a trial court judgment, which had entered a jury verdict of $50 million. Five justices heard the case, and the vote to reverse was three to two. The question pre presented is whether the due process clause of the Constitution uh, was violated when one of the justices in the majority denied the recusal motion. Now. Here are some of the problems that the case poses. Uh, would it have been a violation of the Constitution to give less money? At what point is the uh, number uh, sufficiently high? That is $3 million we know is more than enough. But suppose it was $5,000, or suppose it was the legal $1,000 contribution which this officer gave. Um, suppose the vote hadn't been three to two. The Supreme Court acts as if the problem here is that Justice Benjamin cast the dispositive vote, but wouldn't have been even more of a problem if behind the scenes he persuaded all of his colleagues to vote the same way. Or suppose the case had come out the right way. Wouldn't it still be a problem for the people of West Virginia that someone was sitting on a case uh, even though uh, the uh, outcome wasn't affected? Um, moreover, here's what I see as the central problem, and I think this is the difficulty that you face whenever you try to legislate in this area. The problem is not so much, the Supreme Court acts as if the problem is gratitude to someone who's already given you money. Uh, but for a reason uh, that you referred to earlier, Mr. Calderon, um, judges have very long terms in office. And one of the things we know about human nature is fear of bad things happening to you in the future is more of an incentive for you to change your behavior than gratitude for things that happened in the past. Uh -huh. <laughs> exactly. Well, so here's the problem. Most of the time, and this is true even of the money that uh, Mr. Blankenship spent, the $3 million, it's not spent in a way that lets voters know who's spending it and for what purpose. That is, if you looked at the ads that Mr. Blankenship's money sponsored uh, against the incumbent, they were not ads saying decrease the verdicts in coal company cases. They're all, they all pick out the sort of Willie Horton style case. That is, if you, if you were able to even watch at the bottom of the screen when you were watching the ads that were up there, many of them were sponsored by the insurance industry, even though the, what they were saying is, you know, this man raped my child and now walked free. It's not because the insurance I I industry cares about that. It's because money only matters in judicial elections to the extent it can be translated into votes. Votes are what matter, and money is simply a fuel that gets you votes. And so the fear going forward is not, uh, the thing that worries me about all this money going into judicial elections isn't so much the, rare, the, the, the relatively few cases in which it distorts behavior on behalf of the litigants. It's that it distorts the entire process. And one of the ways we know this is studies that have shown that in the year right before a judge comes up for a re-election, his sentences tend to be higher in criminal cases. It's not because victims are funding these. It's because the insurance companies or the trial lawyers, depending on who they're going after, uh, are funding them by using the levers that affect voters, not by uh, discussing the issue that's actually the motive for them spending the money. And so the Supreme Court's discussion in uh, Citizens United focuses on how unfair this all was to Mr. Caperton. It doesn't focus on the effects it has on justice across the board, and those seem to me to be a larger problem of due process. Um, I want to turn for just a moment to a case that uh, Dean Chemerinsky mentioned that is mentioned in footnote uh, 41 on page 10 of the briefing paper, but is, I think, the fulcrum. That's the relationship between Citizens United and Caperton, and that is the Republican Party against White case. Because that case takes the gloves off not just on what independent expenditures can say about judges, but on what judges themselves can say in campaigns. Uh, and this is an area where I think judges very much want to be tied to the mast. They want to be able to say, I can't comment on these issues. It would be wrong for me to announce my 
uh, intense in particular cases or to discuss anything at more than a relatively high level of generality. But you can see already that judges are starting to slip from that point. Uh, the most particular ad there that uh, brought this home was the ad for the Alabama Supreme Court with uh, Justice Tom Parker, who also started publishing newspaper editorials urging the Alabama Supreme Court to defy the U.S. Supreme Court. And uh, of course, it's very hard in short ads to get any of the information or the issues across, particularly because these are issues that uh, voters are relatively unaware of when the, uh, when the campaigns start. And so this fear of uh, not being reelected because of taking positions in difficult cases is, I think, more of a problem than the gratitude towards past uh, campaign contributors. And it, here I'll just refer to an article written by your old boss, Justice Grodin, in which he talked about the extent to which judges fear electoral retaliation. He said, I like to think I never did, but I can't say with certainty that I didn't. And that's true, you know, if you talk to judges, because this is their livelihood, this is their career uh, that's on the line. So let me turn a little bit now to the public and where the public is on these issues and talk a little bit about this survey. It was a nationwide survey that was designed by and run by the National Center for State Courts uh, in conjunction with an American Bar Association project that uh, now retired Justice O'Connor has been very involved in. The first thing to understand about people and judicial elections like is people do not understand what they're voting on at all. It's not just uh, that they don't know the candidates, it's also they don't understand what courts do. Just to give you a couple of statistics, 38% um, of Americans did not know whether their state had a, a constitution or not. Uh, when people were asked to name the three branches of government, uh, only 21% of them could name all three branches, 44% could not name a single branch. Um, if you ask them about their confidence in the courts, uh, here are some interesting things that came out of our survey. The first is people's confidence in the courts does not vary based on partisan affiliation. Democrats, Republicans, and independents had roughly the same levels of confidence in the courts. Uh, but what did vary dramatically is people who knew nothing versus people who knew something. Oddly enough, for those of us who think of ourselves as cynics, the more people knew about government, the more confidence they had in the courts. Um, that was true for courts. It wasn't true for legislatures or the executive branch. That is, I don't mean people weren't confident. I mean that people's confidence didn't vary based on how much they knew. Yeah, exactly. So, for example, um, I I people were in the mid-60 percent range in having confidence in the legislature and in the executive branch. Uh, and that was true whether they knew anything or they didn't. Whereas for judges, 83 percent of the people who had a high uh, level of civic knowledge, and by high we meant rudimentary, <laughs> uh, had, so had confidence. Uh, but only 65 percent of the people who knew nothing had confidence. Um, and here's the interesting thing. When we ask people, do you have a lot of confidence in the courts? 61% of the legislative and executive branch officials did, but only 22% of the public had a lot of confidence as opposed to some confidence. Now let me say just a little bit about what we learned about judicial independence. Um, judges, uh, the, the question that people were asked is, is it important for judges to be independent or should they pay more attention to the public's view? Well, not surprisingly, 100% of judges said that they should be independent. And 92% of other public officials did. And for people with a high level of knowledge, they supported judicial independence 58% to 38%. People who had a lot of confidence in the judiciary uh, supported judicial independence 60% versus 37% who thought they should be more responsive. By contrast, people who had low knowledge or no confidence in the judiciary thought the judiciary should be more responsive to public opinion. 61% uh, of the people who didn't know much thought judges should listen more to the public. Uh, and 65% of the people who had little or no confidence in judges thought they should listen more to the public. It's very hard to tease out the causal relationship here. That is, whether people who are more confident believe judges are more independent and like it, or whether it's the other way around. Um, but when we ask people what you actually thought judges were doing as opposed to what you wanted, people do not have that high level of confidence. That is. The total 59% versus 34% thought judges actually were too mixed up in politics rather than being able to put it aside. Um, now the interesting thing also here is some cross-state data that we had, which is the voting was roughly the same on these issues whether people lived in states that elected their judges or in states that appointed their judges. 
That is, people thought judges were just as mixed up in politics in states where judges are not politicians in the sense that Dean Chemerinsky talked about at all. But of course, that's because only half of Americans uh, know whether their state elects judges or not. Um, and 30% of the people who live in states with an appointed judiciary think that their judiciary is elected. Um, all that being said, people still want judges to decide um, controversial issues. 71% of people thought judges should decide uh, controversial issues, uh, even though they think they're somewhat mixed up in politics, and even though some of those people obviously don't have much confidence in them. Um, I'll stop there uh, and take questions, uh, if people have any, both about Caperton and about some of the survey data as well. Well, let, let me say, Professor Carlin, uh, and this is, of course, true of Dean Chemerinsky as well, this has been uh, a particularly illuminating and lively discussion for panelists who are really contributing to our knowledge and our decision making here. So thank you very much for a terrific presentation. Um, I, I'd like to um, ask you, first of all, what do you think of some of the recommendations that Dean Chemerinsky made, in particular, because you've also served on the FPPC, so you have a real broad perspective on these issues. Do you think that, for example, the legislature should pass legislation that says that if a judge is uh, the beneficiary of an independent expenditure of a certain amount, that that judge should be required to disqualify herself um, unless the other party, who was not the beneficiary in a case, would seek to waive that? Well, I think it's a very difficult question for the, for the following reason. I, get, I guess there are two, two parts to my answer here. Um, one part is that one of the things I think we have discovered in California over the years is political money is a little bit like water. It seeks its own level. And so when you regulate over here, what often happens is that same money moves over here. Uh, so you see, for example, because the Supreme Court has said that you can't regulate very much with respect to ballot initiatives, what happens is every candidate also has a ballot initiative committee, and the money can go into the ballot initiative committee and be spent in ways that get you around pieces of the FPPC. So one of the things to do when you're legislating this area is to be very careful in thinking about where is the money going to go if we move it out of here. So one of the things we know is you might be able to regulate independent expenditures but only to the extent that those independent expenditures are treated as uh, using magic words or electioneering. That is, uh, a company that simply spends money uh, in a way that discusses uh, a judge's performance, but not in a way that says vote for or against that judge, is going to be much less regulated. Um, because of the First Amendment and the fact that we have a Supreme Court right now that is very committed to a certain kind of free speech uh, and is also very committed, as Dean Chemerinsky said, to the idea that corporations have the same rights to free speech as individuals. And so in thinking about how to regulate corporations, one thing to do is to make it less attractive for them uh, to spend the money. And the question is, how do you make it less attractive? One thing is the disclosure rules could be changed in ways that make it much more costly for the corporations. That is, maybe you should have a disclosure rule that says when a corporation spends money like this, not only does their name have to be in bigger letters, because I know when you watch those ads you did not see, even though the disclosures were in most of them, who was spending the money. Make it bigger and make them list the, the cases that they've had pending for the last five years in that court so that everybody can see why it is they're spending the money. That is, make the disclosures unattractive enough they won't want to spend the money if they also have to spend a lot of time disclosing it in various ways. Mm. Um, so th I, while I'm all for um, trying to push this money out of politics, I think with the U.S. Supreme Court being where it is, it's very hard to push it out. And the question is, what do you do to avoid pushing it into worse forms of spending, more pernicious ones. No, I think it's a, it's a very astute observation. I, I want to continue, though, to be motivated by one of the findings in the research that yeah. you've conducted, and that is even a large percentage of judges think that campaign contributions motivate judicial behavior. Right. Which is a, a, a stunning finding in, in many ways. Right, but one of the problems to understand that about judicial elections is it's not just the money that's spent, it's the fear that money will be spent. That is. Um, you don't actually have to spend the money, and this is one of the terrible problems with Citizens United. You don't actually have to spend the money. You just have to have a credible threat that the money will be spent, and it'll have the same influence. 
Yes. Um, and so one of the things is to, is, is, again, is to, is to be very afraid of the fact that people are thinking about the money that could be spent against them and not just the money that is spent against them. And as I suggested, the money spent against you is more likely to have an effect. And here, California is different than Virginia, West Virginia, in an important way, especially, at the, obviously, at the appellate and Supreme Court level. And that is retention elections have the following characteristic that's not entirely good, which is um, the campaign is run entirely against the sitting judge. That is, uh, when you run for office, you have to at least give some reason people should vote for you. I mean, everybody understands negative campaigning is quite effective, but you also have to have an affirmative campaign. In a retention election, most of the money that's going in is going in in a, a negative way. And so, for example, uh, in Mississippi, the state has set up, the, the bar, Mississippi Bar Association has set up um, a kind of committee to give kind of truth or false, you know, true or false uh, assessments of ads in the campaign so that there's an objective source uh, of information there. But I think that is a tremendous, tremendous problem. And the idea that recusal by itself will solve the problem, it will solve the part of the problem that deals with the actual litigants. It will not solve the problem of judges who are afraid to make unpopular decisions on public issues because they fear uh, litigants who also want to affect their views on a narrow set of cases. So let me, let me ask you this, for a, a couple quick questions, and I'm sure colleagues have questions as well. Do you think that we should adopt different rules with regard to trial judges than regarding appellate judges because they are, the latter are in the retention election category rather than in the competitive election category? Um, you know, I'm not sure about that. I think you, you definitely need to have a different, um, a different uh, threshold um, for them. And I think it is worth trying to experiment here. Honestly, I think it's worth trying to experiment with legislation that takes seriously the idea that judges are different uh, and therefore that they should recuse themselves. Um, so I think it's worth, worth a try. Um, when it comes to what the different standards should be, um, I think it would be a mistake to rely too much on the Supreme Court in Caperton focusing on the fact that Chief Justice Benjamin was the swing justice. Right. Um, because I think it is far worse if you can persuade all of your colleagues to go along with something uh, that you were influenced to do because of a campaign contribution. Um, so I would not, you know, I would not say, for example, don't worry about appellate judges because they're sitting on panels. I'd be just as worried about um, the effects on somebody who's on a panel. Yeah. And, and let me ask you finally, is there? Um, oh, and could oh, I make please. one other question, yeah. which is, um, I, I, you know, I should have looked at this more carefully because before I came up here, but. Um, one question is who decides the recusal motions? In federal court, for example, the judge against whom recusal is being sought decides the recusal motion. And I think one thing you might want to think about either the courts adopting rules on or the legislature coming up with rules is having somebody else look at the recusal motion in a case where somebody claims that the campaign contributions have an impermissible effect. Because I don't think what you want to say is just, uh, uh, for example, in the bill that you now have, it says, well, if it's $1,500, then you have to recuse. Right. Um, I think that should be a floor and not a ceiling. That is, I think people ought to be able to make recusal motions even in cases where uh, somebody has not uh, contributed $1,500. If, for example, that person has organized hundreds and hundreds of people to give. But isn't that permissible now? It, it is, but I think it's important, well, question, it's, it's important it's I think, to make clear that, that the rule is not there's a kind of safe harbor as long as you give 1499, right. uh, there's no problem. That what the rule is is a rule that says right. if you go over the rule, then you definitely have to recuse. But that, but that it's, not, uh, it's not in that sense a safe harbor for people who are under the rule. Under, uh, under the colleagues, amount. thank you very much, Professor. Before we hear from Justice Chin, any further questions for Professor Carlin? Mr. Calderon. I want to deal with, uh, you know, sort of the other side of the equation in terms of elected judges and having an, a non-elected uh, judge system. But starting with um, one of my favorite quotes from Will Rogers, who said, in effect, show me a judge and I'll show you someone who knows a governor. 
What's the case you would make, if you're prepared to do it, for a non-elective appointed system of the judiciary, given the term limited uh, world we live in? Are there enough constitutional um, protections built into our constitution, given how many times it's been amended, to be able to trust that as an appropriate checks and balance system? So I'm not sure if you're, uh, which of two things you're asking me. One is, what are the arguments in favor of an elected judiciary versus an appointed judiciary generally? Um, yeah. And then the second is, given term limits in California, is it the worry that um, an appointed judiciary is, in some sense, a circumvention of the term limits because the people who appoint the judges are appointing judges who are going to outlast yeah, well, the them? The assumption is term yeah. limits had, has made the legislature less of a check, if right. you will, uh, right. on the power of the governor. Right. Um, okay, so the ar argument in favor of an uh, an appointed judiciary, which is generally a judiciary where the governor has a nominating power and the legislature has a confirming power. So most of the places that use an appointed judiciary use a model that's similar to the U.S. Congress, the federal model. Um, the arguments in favor of it are that um, judges uh, are less worried uh, about uh, running for reelection, and that changes their behavior some. Um, that different people are interested in becoming judges under that system. Um, and you can argue that the quality is greater or less. I don't have a firm view on that. That is, the kinds of people who are willing to put themselves up for election are different than the kinds of people who aren't. Uh, their temperaments are different in various ways. Um, I don't actually think that electing judges is the worst thing in the world. I know some people do. The United States is the only advanced country in the world that does elect any substantial number of its judges. Um, but given um, how much law judges actually make, it's not a bad thing uh, to have uh, an elected judiciary. Um, I, I'm not sure that the federal judiciary is less politicized in some ways than uh, state judiciaries, even though it's an appointed judiciary. But as I say, the main thing I, I think is having long terms, and you alluded to this earlier, the longer the term, the less uh, time a judge spends thinking about re-election, as opposed to somebody who's elected every two years who s spends their time thinking about, you know, how am I going to get re-elected, how am I going to get re-elected, and if they're in a term-limited system, how am I going to get re-elected, and then what am I going to do next? Um, and that, quite honestly, is a problem with judges that um, I think is worth thinking about, which is um, judges uh, in the California system, and I've talked to a number of judges in Superior Court and uh, the Court of Appeal over the years, um, many of them um, think about what are they going to do next, and it affects their behavior not in the way that you worry about in a sort of caperton way, but it affects their willingness to sit on particular parts of the trial bench or the like. So they all want to sit in civil complex litigation because that's how you get hired by jams or in dispute or one of the rent judge places afterwards. So one of the things to think about is um, when you have uh, limits on how long a judge can serve, the judge is going to be thinking about what do I do next uh, a lot, and that's a worry. Now, on the checks and balances, um, it seems to me that the California courts have remained a, a very effective check on the legislature and the executive branch, um, and indeed on the people. Uh, and the people's passage of uh, initiatives uh, over the years. I wish they were they were more of a check in some ways, and I wish the legislature were more of a check. Frankly, if I could change something about California, before I would change the elected judiciary to an appointed one, I'd get rid of term limits for the legislature, because I actually think that has more of a problem on the balance of power than whether judges are elected or appointed. Do you think that, just one more thought, do you think, um, what about uh, in terms of judges wondering what they're going to do later uh, when you set a term, uh, is that the case also with appellate court justices that run what, every 12 years? Is it every 12 years? Appellate court justices run for re-election. Um, and my thinking, my question really is, is what if we, what if we extended uh, the term for trial court judges and m made them run statewide? That, I think, would be a disaster because it would require so much money 
to run statewide in California. That is, if you think about the number of media markets and the fact that judicial elections are what political scientists refer to as low salience elections. That is, people don't know very much about judges. If you think about when you go into the voting booth and you've got a bunch of superior court judges, what do you do? You look at what they did before, right? So they all want to be able to say, you know, former district attorney or something under their name. Um, you look for who endorsed them, right? Because there's no way, even somebody who cares deeply about this can't really find out very much to make intelligent decisions. So you look at who endorsed them, um, what did they do before. Uh, I, find, I find it very hard to do. If you had to do that, if you had to do that statewide, but there's several thousand judges, so presumably there'd be several hundred on the ballot each election cycle, even if it's a 20 year cycle, it'd be 75 judges maybe? Well, that, that's, that's I mean, that, that'd be a but, nightmare. But appellate court justices run statewide already, don't they? No, I think they, it, well, the Supreme the Court district. does. Supreme Court does, but the it? Court of Appeal doesn't. They run okay. in, their, in their district. And even there, they're very I'm large. Okay. Oh, it's it's been a long time since I've thought about that. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Justice Calderon. Uh, we'll turn now. No, so thank you, uh, Mr. Monning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Caron, thank you for your testimony. It's been very elucidating. Some of your figures on that polling, um, I don't know if that's contained in the materials you shared with us or if we could get I, I copies of that because it's very uh, informative. Related to that, has, has your study looked into the prospect of publicly financed elections for trial judges, judges that do have to stand every six years and can face an opponent? Um, a lot of these Supreme Court decisions equating free speech to the ability to spend unregulated amounts, um, that would still play in. But in my understanding, in public financing of elections in other jurisdictions, not for judges but for political offices, it's usually a voluntary, the, the candidate volunteers and then there's certain incentives. Once they volunteer to be funded only by public source money, um, they get more access to ballot pamphlets. Um, and if they face a challenger who doesn't agree to the public financing, then that usually triggers greater access to resources. Without getting into all the details, have you looked into or are you aware of any jurisdictions where in judicial races where there are challengers, incumbents and challengers of any public financing scheme? And would that eliminate at least some of the concerns of perception of undue influence um, from direct contributions going to a judicial candidate? Well, North Carolina is the state that has the most well-developed public financing of judges, and I have not looked at any studies from there. It's, relative, it's a relatively new uh, system. I think it was adopted maybe one and a half cycles. Uh, ago. Um, public financing makes a, a difference, but I'm not sure with judicial elections um, where the money gets spent at the, at the back end. That is, if you ask why do people raise money when they're t uh, judges, they raise it for uh, mailers and, and media. They don't raise it for kind of get out the vote efforts or the like. Um, in states in which there's public financing but elections are partisan, are going to have a different effect than in California where there's public, there, if there were public financing, you'd still have nonpartisan judicial races. And so I don't know how you'd translate that exactly. Thank you, Mr. Money. Professor, again, wonderful presentation, very helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And now our third very esteemed panelist uh, is Justice Ming Chin of the California Supreme Court. Uh, he served on the court since 1996. He was previously the presiding justice of the First District Court of Appeal. And among other things, and most relevant for us this morning, uh, he is the chair of the Commission for Impartial Courts, appointed by Chief Justice Ron George for that purpose, here this morning to talk to us about the recommendations of that commission and other observations on the politicization of the judiciary. Justice Chen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have some uh, prepared remarks. Um, <clears throat> as a judge, I'm uh, very cautious and I hesitate to leave those remarks. However, having listened to the prior presentations, I feel that I have to start uh, with some general observations about what has already been said. Uh, first off, I have given presentations on judicial independence at Stanford, 
with Justice O'Connor at uh, UC Irvine <coughs> and at Hastings with Justice Grodin. Justice Grodin recounted the experience that he had, which was not a pleasant one. He also said that he favored not having judicial elections. And as you know, Justice O'Connor has now come down on that side. I must tell you that I'm getting closer to it. The more I hear about what is going on across the country, the more concerned I am about our judicial system. I want to explain to you why the commission did not choose that. As far as I am concerned, and I think you will probably agree with me, here in California, we have a very good judicial system. And I think it's the interest of all of us to keep it that way. Why do we have this system? We have an evaluation of all judicial candidates by the Judicial Nominee Evaluation Commission. Those recommendations go to the governor. We have what is sometimes called a hybrid merit selection system in that they are evaluated, uh, the pluses and minuses are given to uh, the governor's office, the governor picks. We do not have an evaluation system for those attorneys who run against judicial candidates. My commission tried to push that and received a lot of negative comment. One of the individuals who recommended it was Governor Gray Davis. One of the individuals who opposed it was his appointment secretary, Judge Bert Pines. We're open to all points of view. <laughs> um, I thought, why shouldn't everyone be evaluated? But Bert said it will bring too much of the political influence into the evaluation process. First of all, it comes very close to the election. Uh, so eventually the uh, commission um, backed off of it. Uh, I do want to touch a bit on Caperton because it is much worse than just a three million dollar donation. After the uh, Justice Benjamin sat on that case and it was a 3-4 decision, the Chief Justice of West Virginia uh, was caught on a yacht in the Mediterranean with the CEO of Massey. He then the, the case was reheard. He with, finally recused himself. Um, the dissenting justice, uh, Larry Starcher, wrote a vigorous dissent saying this is wrong and encouraged Benjamin to recuse himself, not only the first time, but the second time. Benjamin refused. The chief justice who recused himself then appointed Benjamin the acting chief justice. Benjamin then appoints the two new justices who sit on that case. It's also a 3-2 opinion for the second time. Now you can understand why I am coming closer to the position <laughs> that we should not have judicial elections. If this is what we end up with, you, you've all heard the, the uh, uh, statement that bad facts make bad law. Well, this is the, pri this is the poster child of that, of that saying. But let me go back to the system that we have in California. Uh, Assemblyman Calderon suggested that we have longer limits for longer terms for trial judges. Uh, I think that that is probably a good idea because we will have less elections. Now, when you look at the trial judge situation in California, it is really, as far as elections are concerned, a very small part of what happens. Most of the trial judges in California are never challenged. In my first election into the Alameda Superior Court, I was not challenged, so my name was not on the ballot. Governor Duke Majin happened to appoint me to the Court of Appeal, so I was on the ballot for a retention election and 
presumably on the ballot for the uh, uh, trial court. But my name was never on the ballot for Alameda County. Actually, actually, the Alameda County Clerk's Office called me after the election and said, Justice Chin, aren't you going to come over and sign your uh, uh, oath? And I said, I don't think so. I, I signed the oath, for the, obviously, for the Court of Appeal. But I go through this analysis for you because I think that Assemblyman Calderon's suggestion that you have longer terms, and I don't have any idea of what they might be, whether you go to eight years or 12 years, but it seems to me that you will remove this election chaos from the uh, process. Now, one of the questions asked of me by one of my former colleagues on the Court of Appeal was, Ming, in your commission, why didn't you make all judicial elections retention elections? And I said, Tony, can you imagine having 150 judges every year on the LA ballot for retention? And when, when in any one year, there may be five, six, 10, maybe 20 at the most who are challenged, even in LA County, and in most counties throughout the state, no one is challenged. I don't think you wanna upset the apple cart to try to solve some of these problems. Uh, that is why I'm veering away from my prepared remarks, and um, June, maybe we could give the members uh, my prepared remarks, and you could have both and read it at your leisure. Um, I uh, <clears throat> think that it is important for you to understand the Chief Justice's thinking on the appointment of the Commission for Impartial Courts. You all know about the initiatives across the country, the jail for judges in South Dakota, the retroactive term limits for um, Colorado, the um, uh, one in Oregon where they were trying to uh, uh, set geographic limits uh, so that it would remove large, per large percentages of the uh, appellate judges. Fortunately, all of these machinations uh, in, in the states um, uh, failed, but they're starting to pop up again. There's another one in Colorado, apparently, according to uh, Bert uh, Brandenburg from the Justice at Stake. Uh, I, I just met with him after Citizens United came out, and Bert said that there's another one in, in Colorado. Now, what do all of these states have in common that we do not have in California? They have very small populations. They were able to get these initiatives on the ballot without a great deal of signature gathering. It take, uh, fortunately, I guess, we have a blessing in California that it takes a fortune to get these matters on the ballot. So hopefully uh, we uh, uh, will be able to dodge these bullets, but I submit to you they will come if we are not ready. And I think that your interest in this subject matter is so, so very important because of, as I've had these conversations with the faculty uh, uh, and the students at Stanford, the alumni at Stanford, with the alumni at Hastings, with the students at Hastings, with the students and the alumni, well, no longer, not yet alumni of UC Irvine, uh, <coughs> but uh, the future lawyers of, uh, that uh, Dean uh, Chemerinsky uh, uh, is so ably uh, training. Um, in all of these conversations, I stress the importance of an impartial and independent judiciary. Historically, it is important and it is so important that we have distinguished legislators just like you who are interested in the subject matter with whom we can carry on conversations about what to do, what not to do, to try to uh, prepare ourselves for the attacks that certainly will come. And the U.S. Supreme Court cases, I, I will not criticize um, the work of people who review my work. <laughs> but there are some problems that have been pointed out by both of the distinguished professors. Um, I don't know what's going to happen as a result of Citizens United, but certainly the predictions of the dean um, uh, could very well happen. With the 71 recommendations of the Commission for Impartial Courts, we made these decisions based upon the current state 
of judicial elections in California. They are not all that bad yet. They could get worse. This should be a document that is not static. It should not be enshrined as the Ten Commandments. Actually, if you had a committee draft the Ten Commandments, it would probably look something like my report. <laughs> but it should not be enshrined because we, together, should be able to react to what happens as a result of Citizens United. We should be able to react what happens as a result of Caperton. And the one case that I do want to talk about is Minnesota versus White. Um, I feel a little bit of license to, to comment about it because Justice O'Connor spoke at the Judicial Conference in San Francisco for the uh, California judges uh, looking at the problem and deciding that we needed a commission to look at the various aspects of judicial elections. Justice O'Connor spoke about Minnesota versus White, and as you all know, she was the fifth vote. And she said, what has happened as a result of Minnesota versus White gave her pause. Gave her pause because how states have, how, how public uh, interest groups have reacted to that decision. Now, you all know that judges for the Superior Court, judges who are on the retention ballot for both the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court, get tons of questionnaires asking them what their positions are on every major social issue that you could imagine. <laughs> but do you want a judge to state their, his or her public opinion about major social issues? My, my, my answer to that is if they do, they should recuse themselves when that case comes before them. Uh, but people, not, people may not always see it the way I see it. So I think it's a, a major concern. Now, Governor Wilson spoke, we had a public hearing for the commission here in um, Los Angeles. Governor Wilson spoke, Governor Davis spoke. Tom Moyer, I'm not sure if any of you know him, he was the former chief of Ohio, recently passed away. Tom was a dear friend. He worked tirelessly on these issues. Uh, and he came out from Ohio to speak about the importance of judicial independence. And one of those ads you saw was from Ohio. Uh, so uh, <coughs> uh, the, uh, the former uh, Governor Pete Wilson uh, suggested that we have a, uh, have the legislature put on the ballot an initiative saying judges need not answer these questionnaires. I would add silly questionnaires, but uh, <laughs> <coughs> I think that's a nuclear option. Ho let's hope it doesn't come to that. We don't need more initiatives in California. Uh, ho hopefully the, the, the way that we have drafted the uh, commission uh, report will solve some of the, uh, the problems such as rather than having judges not have any idea what to do when they get these questionnaires, to have sample questionnaires with questions that judges can answer that will help inform the uh, uh, public about why these particular people as opposed to those particular people ought to be uh, elected. Now, I find that de the dean's uh, comment about once you have elections, Judges are politicians. That concerns me. But I was relieved when the dean said, but judges should not be treated like other candidates. And I, because I think that is so true. We cannot have judges be involved in nasty, partisan, judicial, not that your campaigns are nasty and partisan, <laughs> but some of them are. Uh, so we, I don't think we can have judges in, involved in um, that sort of thing. And, and I think we ought to keep those kinds of campaigns that you saw on those ads out of California. And I would be willing to work with any one of you or all of you to ensure that that happens. Joseph Chin, thank you very much. Um, I, Mr. Hammond, just one quick question before I turn to, to you. Uh, one to answer at the end, which is what you think would be the most important steps we can take to prevent such ads 
from reaching here. The ads are a surrogate for a whole style of campaigning, obviously. Quick question I want to ask you is, in your report, you note the importance uh, and propose that there be a disqualification process in place for both appellate and Superior Court just judges uh, when they receive meaningful campaign contributions, but you also know that there are substantial differences in the way Superior Court judges and appellate judges uh, handle their jobs, the roles that they play, the processes they go through and so forth. Um, how would you summarize what you think the differences in rules should be when it comes to disqualification for campaign contributions between Superior Court and appellate court judges? Uh, First of all, let me give you a general overview of the recusal and what, hap what, it, what it does to the work process within the courts. Uh, obviously, for the Supreme Court, when somebody recuses, the Chief Justice has to appoint someone to step in. Uh, so I think that makes, uh, we should keep recusals to a minimum. I think the Dean is right. Uh, uh, I don't want to admit it, but uh, in general, he, or just he, on this one point. <laughs> oh, I always make it limited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know that you have a concern about the six-year versus the two-year and and the length of time uh, for recusal, and uh, I I appreciate the dean's answer that if there is a, um, a bias at two years, how, why does it go away? So that obviously strengthens your position. I simply would ask you to take a step back. Um, these recusals, for instance, I was in family law. I had 40 matters on the calendar on any one morning, every morning. You're going to ask that family law judge who was elected to keep that whole thing in his or her head for six years? Uh, maybe you're right, I don't know, but I would ask you to at least consider making it a shorter period of time because the work process in a law and motion calendar, the work process in a master calendar, uh, uh, I would not want to see the heavy, it, it, it is not a problem for a trial judge that tries one death penalty case every six months. There, is, there are no recusals, but if you have attorneys coming through your courtroom, it's like a uh, windmill. You, you, you cannot run a calendar like that if, the back, if in the back of your mind you're always concerned for six years about uh, who contributed $100 or who contributed, yeah. anyway. Yeah, I can see you want to ask me more questions. Well, actually, no, I want to allow Mr. Hagman to do so. I do want to point out that the approach memorialized in the legislation that's currently pending here would not require the judge to keep that information in his or her mind, but rather leave it to the litigants to, from campaign reports to determine for themselves when they wish to bring a recusal motion based on this. Otherwise, it would, I agree with you, be impractical. Mr. Hagman. Let me just go back to the... You know, I think California is unique compared to some of these ads we saw in the states because of our size of population and our size of a judiciary bench that goes very extensive. Um, in 99% of the time, most of those jurists are interpreting the law and applying it to a case. They're not seeing themselves out, I think, as a target that like some of these states may do when there's very limited um, justices on there. I'm seeing, um, the environment here in California, do you, can you see any differences with the other states besides being the, the depth of population base we have and the cost for doing campaigns in the state is so much higher than those other states as well? Can you see a um, particular sense where, or a particular level um, through the court process that may be more apt to, to ads like this because of only a few of the justices actually handle certain matters? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. I think. When you look at some of these other states where their whole state population may be less than some of our senatorial districts out here, where you could do a campaign in there much easier. And when you go through this, if you find you're not getting fair treatment in one court, you go to another court that has a totally different population base, totally different juris system, or even out of the county or even to different appellate divisions, do you see those same facts lining up for potential of campaign abuse here 
and what circumstances may you see that? Is there a particular set of judges or a particular set of um, departments that may be more prone to that than others, I guess? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Hickman, I think that what saves California currently is the retention system. I think it is so much better than the jurisdictions from which these ads have come. I mean, many of those are contested party elections. I mean, you have competing oil companies donating in Texas. The uh, chief, former chief of Texas, uh, Tom Phillips, asked me to come to a program in uh, Chicago. And when I met all of the uh, Supreme Court justice, uh, many of the Supreme Court justices across the country, and they told me the horror stories that happen in their jurisdictions because of contested elections and contested party elections for the uh, for Supreme Courts, I said, California is not so bad. Um, I think we ought to watch it. Uh, we ought to watch it carefully. And as I said before, let's not make decisions now that will affect what happens in California in five years. If these things start happening in California, we ought to be able to react to stop them. Mr. Hagman, thank you. Please continue. I'm sorry, just maybe a follow-up too. And I'm trying to think if we do take some suggestions like extending the term for the length between elections um, or even appointments for the one extreme or the other, what systems would you balance that out with for the citizens to be able to, I mean, is there a check and, check and balance system here? How do we find out the ones that may be going too aggressive on their bench or may not be following and applying their laws in the same care as other justices? What kind of review balance can we have to balance out the longer terms or no terms at all, I guess? What kind of suggestions may you have for that? Well, don't get me wrong. I'm uh, with uh, Professor Carlin. Um, in that I don't think that the election process that we have now is all that bad. Uh, but I can certainly see uh, that as we go down this road together that it could get really bad. And I think we should be prepared to look at exactly what you're talking about. How, how do we balance uh, the interest of the public in seeing that their judges are deciding cases based upon the merits of those cases and not based upon any other considerations, political or otherwise. Now, Justice Scotland whis whispered to me, do you really think, no, I think he said it this way, he said, I don't think that judges um, weigh and balance political contributions uh, first of all, uh, most judges don't have political contributions, but I think even those that get political contributions, um, I don't think when we're making decisions we're thinking about that. Uh, and I know what, the, uh, w what some of the polls, I, I believe uh, Professor Carlin um, uh, suggested that some of the polls thought that their large number of judges thought that that was a, a problem. Um, if it is a problem, we should fix it, but I, uh, don't know any judges that sit around, I don't know any judges who sit around and talk about who's donating what. Um, I, <laughs> we have too many other things to do, uh, but uh, if it becomes a problem, we should certainly address it. Thank you. Mr. Huffman? You have a I, yeah. Um, first, Your Honor, I want to thank you very much and, and the other panelists as well. This is a, and thank the Chair. This is a terrific lineup of folks, and uh, appreciate you sharing your thoughts and expertise with us. So uh, I get a couple of messages from uh, today's proceeding. One is um, we all understand the corrosive influence of money in judicial elections. We're trying to manage that uh, through some recusal processes, but I think Professor Carlin's point about probably the more corrosive chilling effect of uh, fear of retribution and the fact that now with Citizens United there's nothing to prevent a scourge of independent expenditures from descending on California and really doing some bad things uh, to the independence of our judiciary. And so until that wonderful day when we have public financing and figure out a way to stop independent expenditures, I sort of see us suggesting, I think appropriately, that um, fewer elections uh, might be part of the solution. I, I think 
one of the challenges we're going to have with the public, though, uh, and I agree with that, by the way, uh, one of the challenges is the public is going to see that as drifting further from accountability. And I wonder if any of you have suggestions on how we might be able to assure the public that a rogue judge, someone who needs to be held to account during this long period of whatever it is, the Calderon-like uh, tenure. <laughs> 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 uh, what, what can we offer them in that regard? What, what kind of accountability mechanism might uh, be a, a trade-off for, for this insulation from the politics of it all? One, one of the examples I always give um, Assemblyman Huffman is what other branch of government other than the judiciary explains their opinions in excruciating, sometimes in excruciating detail. <laughs> Every time we come out, it has to be reasoned and analyzed and uh, uh, we have to uh, cite authority. Now you might say, well, trial judges don't write uh, appellate opinions, but their decisions are reviewed by the Court of Appeal and I must admit that uh, Justice Scotland and his colleagues do a meticulous job of reviewing those. So that review process is really, really important. And actually, um, um, Senator Steinberg uh, had a conversation with me about this. And I said, when I was on the trial court, every time I had a jury trial, I sent out a jury questionnaire to every one of those jurors, asking them, what did you think of the process? What did you think of my courtroom? What did you think of the lawyers? Almost every one of those were returned to me. And I looked at them, I analyzed them, and I made adjustments in my courtroom if I thought it was appropriate. So I think that kind of accountability and feedback is really important. I would recommend that to any trial judge, because you get those evaluations from the people who have been sitting in your courtroom for the last six months. Um, and it gives you a good picture. It's, it, it's a barometer, so to speak, of what kind of a courtroom you're running and whether or not it satisfies the people who are there just to serve uh, as, as jurors. So I, I think there are many things like that that, uh, that should be done to give judges feedback on what they're doing. I think that's a part of accountability. And I know that uh, Senator, S the, the uh, Senate uh, pro tem was concerned that the commission wasn't uh, uh, concerned enough about accountability. But I think these are some of the things that, uh, that we should talk about. And there may be more. Thank you, Mr. Huffman. You actually haven't heard anybody explain anything in, in excruciating detail like Mr. Huffman discussing water policy, so we're, so we're, so we're clear. So. <laughs> I've got to tell you a story. I get, once gave a I wrote an opinion a story on about this? I, I once gave an, a, I wrote an opinion on water, so the water board asked me to give a speech at their conference on water. So my son came and I said, Jason, what did you think of the speech? He said, Dad, I now know more about water than I ever wanted to know. <laughs> Colleagues, any further questions for Justice Chen? I just have one quick Mr. Calderon. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Justice money is like water. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Justice, but before you, you conclude, I do want to end where I sought we conclude with you, and that is, if you had to identify, given everything you've heard today, the 71 recommendations from your commission and any other information you want to rely on, what would you say is the most important step that we can be taking as a legislature, legislature now to fend off those commercials, to fend off the kind of politicization that we all want to avoid? Um, one of the major portions of the report deals with education. What you're doing right here is really important. Uh, I met with Jack O'Connell, the uh, superintendent of uh, instruction, and we talked about what is needed in the school system. We, we are bringing up, and uh, Professor Carlin talked about the three branches of government, and so many people have no clue of what they are. 
They all, however, can tell you the names of the three stooges. <laughs> this is a sad commentary on an electorate that needs to be informed about our democracy. I think that whatever we do, we carry on these conversations, we work with the Department of uh, Education and try to get some uh, minimal uh, requirements as far as students are concerned um, with regard to civics education. Um, Assemblyman Hagman mentioned that whenever there's a judicial election, most people have not a clue of who the judges are or whether or not they're qualified. How many times have people walked up to you and said, should I vote for these people on the ballot that are up for election as far as judges are concerned? Uh, we really do have to have a more informed process to inform people about the judicial process, judicial elections. Um, I've worked with the uh, League of Women Voters to try to get their influence in uh, putting out uh, election materials on, on judges. So I think this whole idea of education, a conversation about why an impartial and independent judiciary is so important to our system and how it can be taken away in an instant if we let these crazy ads come to California. Thank you. Could I, uh, as for final words, could I ask that Dean Chemerinsky and Professor Carlin rejoin us here? And if, if you have any final words based on what you've heard as this hearing has proceeded, that will give us the really best advice that you have to offer, and then we'll adjourn. Because this is a committee that, that is prepared to take your advice extremely seriously. Let me ask you. Besides what's been said previously, what's the most important further work we can engage in, the most important legislation we could author to address these concerns? Dean? I would agree with Justice Chin that I think that it's so important to focus on education of the public with regard to the judicial process. I think looking at their recommendations is a great start. I also would hope that the Senate would pass the bill with regard to recusal of judges, and I would hope that you would consider ex expanding it to include independent expenditures as well as contributions. Thank you, Dean. Professor Carlin? And, and, and I agree as well that the long haul is really um, important, that uh, all of the data suggests people who understand the system are more likely to trust the system, uh, and so I think that's, that's really critical, is that people understand the system better. Um, and I think you're right to pass a bill that requires recusal because the U.S. Supreme Court rule is only going to be for the extreme case and it's not going to be for the kind of uh, everyday case. And I would urge you to think about expanding the kinds of disclosure that are required by people who make uh, both independent expenditures and other kinds of spending on judicial elections. I know I speak on behalf of all the committee members. We are incredibly grateful for your very incisive testimony today. Are the members of the public who wish to be heard? Please come forward if you wish to. There, you can use that microphone. You can supplant my staff here, whatever you'd like. Thank you. I'm Art Scotland, presiding justice of the Court of Appeal, Third Appellate Judge. I did not intend to speak today, but I, if I could take just two or three minutes. Sure. Have a seat, please. Um, one thing, uh, first of all, I commend all of you for looking into this very significant area and very important area. I would hope that in your decision making, you should not let perception uh, uh, prevail over reality. And I just have to make a few comments. I have been a uh, member of the judiciary for 23 years, a trial judge for two years. I've been in the Court of Appeal for 21 years. I have served at times with, with the uh, appellate justices appointed by five different governors of different political philosophies. I have served with justices that politically are s very far apart. And I can say I'm not so naive to think that there are no judges ever that have in, in been influenced by fear or by gratitude. But I can say very confidently, at le least respect to the thir third appellate district, there has never been a case that I have ever felt that anyone was driven by some political view or some interest in, uh, in, in developing some personal um, um, public policy. Uh, the, for me, I don't have any fear about v being voted out of office because if I were, I could go out and make a lot more money than I'm making now. It's not a fear. It really isn't. And I think that we never have compromised our intellectual integrity in a decision-making process. The other thing that I wanted to say very quickly is um, 
There is a perception by some that judges are politicians. We are not politicians. We do not have constituencies. We don't run to advance political agendas. Uh, we don't make public policy. We interpret the law, but that's not making public policy. If you look at my decisions, you will find many decisions saying if there's a flaw in the statutory scheme, it should go to the legislature to be fixed and not by judges. And, and I, can show, I can show you many of those citations from not only me but my colleagues. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out is can you correct? Is there a way to correct the rogue judge? There actually is, uh, there are ways, existing ways to correct the rogue judge. One is by the election process. When that judge comes up for election, then someone could challenge that judge. And, and another way, frankly, is the Commission on Judicial Performance. A and that is if a judge is not fulfilling that judge's constitutional obligation to apply the law fairly and responsibly and is letting other influences uh, prevail, then that, that judge could be referred to the Commission on Judicial Appointments. So that is a, um, another thing. Uh, the last thing, I, uh, one other thing I wanted to say very quickly is be careful for mischief on anything that you do. If you have certain rules, people can take advantage of the rules. For example, if there is a limit, if there's a recusal at a certain limit, I could see, I could envision someone making a contribution to a judge, knowing then that that would result in that judge having to recuse him or herself, and they are doing it under the guise purportedly of trying to help, but they're really trying to hurt that judge to keep that person off. And then the un last thing, if I could say, and I apologize, I don't want to take too long, is if you were to ask me the question, and, and I commend you for your questions, if you were to ask me the question of what you could do to best deal with the problem, I think, and, and I'm going to get some flack from this by a number of people, but I think you eliminate open seat elections. You have every election go to a or every seat go to a gubernatorial appointment, because in that process you have the Jenny Evaluation Committee. You have a very vigorous evaluation of the qualifications of these individuals. And if you look anecdotally, if you look to see where the problem judges are. Uh, and th we have some fine elected judges, don't get me wrong, many of wonderful elected judges, but if you look to see uh, from the commission, commission on Judicial Performance Records, most, many of the judges that are being sanctioned are those that have been elected because they have not gone through this evaluation process. So one thing you might want to think about is there should never be an open judicial election. They should go to gubernatorial appointment subject to then by, by an election. That's just my thought. Thank you for your, thank you for your testimony. I do just want to point out that in the legislation that's pending now, there is a provision designed to avoid the mischief that you describe. The, the party other than that which made the donation is permitted to waive the qualification so that you don't end up with the gaming of the system under which there's a donation made precisely to disqualify. But thank you for your testimony. Others who wish to be heard? Mr. Chairman. Seeing none. Mr. Calderon. Yes. Um, well, just, just to react to uh, Justice Scott, I'm sorry. Scotland, like the country. Oh, okay, Scotland. Um, you know, you always, whenever you have, an, if you're going to have an elected an individual, elected officer, you're always going to have that officer worrying about re-election generally. You know, and my, and I hearken you back to the miracle on 24th Street when the judge had to decide whether or not Santa Claus truly did exist. <laughs> So I, you know, I think that those are always considerations. And while judges may not, you know, think about any particular contribution or support or, that they may have or opposition they may have had, uh, some judges probably to pay more attention to that than others, as you recognize. But I, but I guess the point I wanted to to make here is that I, I couldn't agree more with Justice Chen about the importance of education. And I think. However, that starts with, um, with education that, that is a collaborative effort. We are leaders in our own right and we're talking to each other. We need to find a way together to talk to the public uh, in a way that's fair and a way that educates them. And, uh, and that's something that I have found is very, very difficult to do. Um, uh, you can talk to members in different, leaders in different areas, whether it's the press, judiciary, the governor's office, um, you know, the League of Women Voters, other uh, advocacy groups, and you, you probably will get a general consensus 
about how we can make California better. But so far, I haven't been able to find the vehicle to bring all of those views together for a consensus view that everyone would feel comfortable going to the public in terms of an education. Now, I, I realize it'd have to be a broad general consensus view, um, but I think that is where we ought to start working um, if we're going to begin to educate the public, and I do believe we need to educate the public, whether it's through some initiative um, that is introduced uh, that would make California better uh, at best, but at the very least allow for a basis of, of public discussion about what is um, not working in California and what can work in California. But, but those of us that do polls and those of us that have a perspective, whether it's on the bench or legislature or, government or some other leadership, leadership position, we have got to be able to agree and speak with um, the same voice uh, so that we're more so that we are patriots as opposed to partisans, if you will. So anyway, I just, I, I think that that's part of our task here. We need to stop talking to each other and we need to start talking to the public. Thank you, Mr. Calderon. Uh, this has uh, been, been a great example of the oversight process, which is going to become much more vigorous in the legislature generally uh, starting this year. As we conclude, I want to extend a special amount of gratitude to the terrific staff of the Assembly Judiciary Committee for making this hearing possible and so meaningful. Thank you to all participants. We stand adjourned.